With the amount of lethal aid that the US is delivering to Ukraine to help defend themselves against the ongoing Russian invasion, it's logical to ask, could the US conquer Russia on its own? To answer that, we need to take a closer look at both countries' militaries, compare their strengths and weaknesses, and get clear on who is the bravest and the baddest armed force out there. Starting off with a deep dive, let's talk about nuclear power. Here's the thing. We need to accept that comparing US and Russian military power will have to exclude the use of nuclear weapons by either side. Why? Well, the US and Russia have roughly equal parity in nuclear warheads, with reportedly 5,900 total operational nuclear warheads for Russia and 5,400 for the US. Included in these stockpiles, yep, it's a tie. Russia and the US each have about 1,600 active, deployed, strategic nuclear warheads. However, these numbers are just best guesses, since neither country will confirm nor deny their active nuclear forces, and only rarely will they confirm where such weapons are being kept. It's scary to be kept in the dark on this topic, right? Well, it gets scarier. Apparently, Russia claims to have a working dead hand system in place, also known as the perimeter system, that will automatically launch Russia's nuclear forces if an attempted first strike is launched to decapitate Russian leadership. While this system is supposed to be offline under normal circumstances, it's not clear when Russia has this system set to on. It's quite likely that since 2014, during Russia's earlier invasion of eastern Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula, this system may have been continually online, in order to prevent a decapitating first strike by US forces. It gets worse. Putin apparently placed Russia's entire nuclear forces on high alert in February of 2022, following the invasion of Ukraine and NATO and the West's response to support the defenders. There is no indication that the high alert status has been revoked. In fact, as of March 29, 2023, President Putin has announced that Russia will no longer give advanced warning of their nuclear weapons tests, following their February announcement that they would no longer allow the US to inspect their nuclear weapons sites as part of the decades-old START weapons treaty. With all these unsettling red flags in place, let's shift gears and take a look at other aspects of the US and Russian militaries. Who do you think has the best army, budget, and weaponry? The short answer is, there really is no comparison. The US military is currently vastly superior to anything Russia can muster. Everything we've seen from the invasion of Ukraine so far shows that the Russian army, navy, and air force have been completely overrated by Western analysts and have been manhandled expertly by Ukraine's outnumbered but valiant defenders. What's left of Russia's once vaunted military is being chewed up faster than they can replace them. But it wasn't always this way. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the US had roughly equal conventional forces, at least in numbers. The USSR had an advantage in raw numbers of tanks and artillery, especially in the areas bordering Western Europe and its NATO member countries, while the US had a larger and more advanced air force, navy, and special forces. But since the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, the two sides have grown steadily and dramatically apart in terms of the sophistication of their tanks and aircraft, the reliability of their state-of-the-art weapon systems, and their respective capability to project power into other regions and spheres of influence. For example, Russia currently has only one working aircraft carrier, an older, fuel-oil-burning ship launched in 1985 named the Admiral Kuznetsov, which, oddly enough, was built in Ukraine. This ship has suffered a string of serious accidents, from shipboard fires to repair cranes falling on its flight deck during repairs. When it does travel, it never sails far from its home port without a seagoing tug to tow it back home. It isn't even in current deployment having been in different dry docks undergoing continual repairs since 2018, and it's known to leave an incredibly dark trail of dense smoke due to an inability for its boilers to fully burn its low-grade fuel. The whole ship is an embarrassment to the world's navies, yet it's the largest capital ship Russia still has afloat, so they'll do anything to try and keep it going. You might see it back on the high seas in 2024, maybe. In comparison, the United States is completing its second carrier in the Ford class, the most advanced and largest aircraft carrier class in the world. The US Navy currently operates 11 carrier strike groups, each of which is built around a nuclear-powered carrier. Each of these strike groups incorporates multiple ships that includes Aegis-class carriers, nuclear-powered attack submarines, destroyers, minesweepers, and additional support and resupply ships. Each Ford-class carrier will be able to support more than 75 aircraft, including the latest fifth-generation aircraft the F-35C. 
along with state-of-the-art drones, airborne warning and surveillance aircraft. These carrier strike groups allow the US to patrol the world's oceans and project air power far from the US mainland. Russia has no equivalent capability and likely never will. The same inequality exists in their respective air forces and it's only widening. While the US has both the F-35 and F-22 fifth-generation stealth fighters, Russia's only close to but not quite fifth-gen fighter, the Su-57, can't deploy over Ukraine for fear of being shot down. Meanwhile, the US is already making progress on the NGAD, the next-generation air dominance system, which includes new weapons, advanced sensors, networking and battle management suites, redesigned jet engines and innovative combat drones that will be designed around a truly groundbreaking 6th-gen fighter to replace the F-22, which, even though it's being replaced, still remains the best dogfighting combat aircraft in operation. The US Navy is also working on a 6th-gen carrier-based stealth fighter under the current program name FAXX. Prototypes may already be flying and the current Navy budget has already earmarked over $9 billion in funding for further development. On the other side of the equation, Russia claims to be working on a 5th-gen++ fighter, the Mikoyan pak dp also known as the MiG-41. But so far, it barely exists in reduced-sized wind tunnel mock-ups and may not be seen as a flying prototype until sometime in the mid-2030s. Then, there are the respective tank forces. The US Abrams tank may not be the world's best. Some argue that spot is taken up by the Israeli Makava, the German Leopard 2, or the British Challenger 2. But the Abrams has been battle-tested since the first Gulf War in 1990 and has been continually upgraded and improved. Currently, the Abrams M1A2 System Enhancement Package version 4, SEP version 4, will employ third-generation 3-gen FLIR, forward-looking infrared advanced optics that allow tank commanders to identify and attack targets farther away than ever before. Of course, Russian fanboys will point to the much-vaunted T-14 Armata as the best tank in the world. Except, well, where to begin? The tank was designed around the A85-3 engine, a copy of an X-shaped German engine which was never designed for tank propulsion. The tank's electronics and computer controls suffer from a lack of advanced computer chips, which under Western sanctions has been a real Achilles heel for the Russian economy. Captured Russian drones show they are so desperate for computer chips that they've resorted to using stolen Swedish traffic cameras for their guts. Without a consistent supply of computer chips, there's no way Russia can mass-produce the Armata. That wasn't bad enough. The production company for the Armata, UVZ, is busy upgrading previously mothballed T-62s and supporting the overworked T-72B3 and T-90M assembly lines. Currently, any Armatas being assembled are being done by hand. By hand. That may work for limited production Rolls Royces and Lamborghinis, but it doesn't bode well for the implementation of a mass-produced battlefield weapons platform. Without any Armatas in Ukraine, and with a greater reliance on more outdated and poorly retrofitted Soviet-era models, the Abrams is far and away better than the vast majority of the surviving Russian tank forces. I say surviving because as of March 2023, the Russians have lost, at a bare minimum, an astounding 1,900 main battle tanks. Everything from the upgraded but still outdated T-72s to around 58 of their more modern T-90s. This means that more than half of their country's entire pre-invasion active tank force has been destroyed or captured. And this number is only what's been positively verified by Western observers like the Oryx team of open source analysts. According to the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies, the total could be anywhere from 20% to 40% higher. Russia is so desperate for replacement tanks that they're even bringing in not just the T-62s from their mothballed tank graveyards, but as of March 23, 2023, even some 75-year-old T-54s and 55s. That would be like the US bringing back its Korean War-era M47 and M48 patterns. The bad news doesn't stop there. Russia has also lost around 800 infantry fighting vehicles, lightly armored trucks and transports, 2,200 armored fighting vehicles like the various MBT, MBD, and BTR models, 230 mobile command posts and communication units, 300 engineering vehicles, 190 towed artillery pieces, 370 self-propelled artillery, 190 multiple rocket launchers, MLRS, 100 surface-to-air systems, 2,300 unarmored transports, jeeps, and other vehicles, 
Honestly, at this point, it's almost easier to count which tanks and vehicles Russia has left, rather than try to keep up with the ones they've lost. And again, all of this has happened not against NATO or the US directly, but against much smaller Ukraine, and in just over a year. The Russian Air Force, when it's deigned to make an appearance over the battlefield, has also suffered unusually high casualties. It's estimated that 6-8% of its active tactical combat aircraft have been destroyed, including around 15% of its pre-invasion multi-role and ground attack aircraft, including the more advanced Su-30SM and Su-34. Douglas Barry, a military aviation analyst at the IISS, believes at least 20 Su-34 strike aircraft have been lost, along with one or two of their top-of-the-line Su-35s. And if you're still counting, you can tack on a minimum of 80 combat helicopters. Russia's navy isn't doing any better. In April of 2022, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the cruiser Moskva, was sunk by Ukrainian drone attacks, though Russia at first claimed it was due to a fire started by careless smokers. Following that meme show, the frigate Admiral Makarov assumed the role of flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, but it was attacked less than a month later in May of 2022. It's not confirmed, but the Makarov might now be inoperable. All told, the Russian Navy has lost 18 ships of various sizes and has had to pull all of its ships of any value back from the Western Black Sea due to fears of more air and sea drone attacks. Not a very good showing against a country that officially has no navy. Then there's the overall troop losses. According to several estimates, Russia has lost as many as 200,000 to 270,000 troops, either killed, wounded or missing, or captured in the invasion of Ukraine. And with close to 2 million men of draftable age having left the country to avoid Putin's first conscription in 2022, those troops won't be easily replaced. Neither will the hundreds of trained pilots, nor the hundreds of highly trained elite paratroopers and special forces killed in the first days of the war in the failed attack on the Hostomel airport, and in the equally disastrous attempt to assassinate President Zelensky. And because the Russian army has never created an independent, think-for-yourself NCO cadre, and must be led by higher leaders who do all the thinking for the frontline troops, an astounding 14 generals have been confirmed to have died in the fighting. As of just May of 2022, Moscow had admitted that they had lost more than 300 high-ranking officers, a third of them members of the senior staff, namely colonels, lieutenant colonels, and majors. And this is only from a single year of combat against what is arguably a second-tier military, though Ukraine is punching way above its weight class. There are several reasons why Russia's military is doing so poorly. Institutional kleptocracy Somewhere between 30% and 40% of Russia's annual military budget is siphoned off by oligarchs, commanders, and even Putin himself, who has an estimated fortune of over $200 billion. You can't expect your tank's reactive armor to operate when someone claimed to buy the explosives but instead put egg carton cardboard into the pouches where the explosives are supposed to go. Outdated tactics With the serious degradation of its military both in numbers and quality, Russia has come to rely more and more on World War I tactics, namely massed artillery barrages and human wave attacks. The Russian commanders issue top-down commands that often bear little to no awareness of the current battlefield's logistics. This stems in part from Russia's incapability of creating an educated and well-trained NCO corps, which all other Western nations rely on. The inability to adjust Russia seems incapable of learning from its mistakes. It's fought battles where its tanks bunched up and became easy targets for Ukrainian artillery, aided by spotter drones or simply rolled through minefields without any concern for the consequences. We'll discuss one such example later on, in the Battle of the Sevyevsky Donets. This rigidity is another result of a lack of a properly trained NCO corps who might be able to adjust avenues of attack and better coordinate tactics at the point of opposition. The only element of the Russian armed forces that Putin seems able to rely on is his nuclear arm. And as we've already agreed, we're not including these in our discussions, for now at least. But Putin continues to rattle his nuclear sabers every chance he gets, as if that's the only way he can keep NATO and the US from placing boots on the ground in Ukraine. But it's clear from the battlefield that Ukraine needs no additional troops, just the advanced weaponry and ammunition that is already flowing into the country as we speak. There are three recent battles that showcase Russia's surprising ineptitude in modern warfare. The Battle for Antonov Airport, February 24, 2022. Within hours of President Putin's announcement of his invasion of Ukraine, 
sorry, his special military operation, a coordinated effort was made to land paratroopers, known as the VDV, and other special forces at Kyiv's Antonov Airport, otherwise known as the Hostomel Airport, named for the city in which it's located. An estimated 30 to 40 Russian helicopters led the airborne invasion, supported by a handful of fighter aircraft. If it had been successful, this operation would have paved the way for dozens of large Il-76 troop transports to land. Those planes would have carried thousands of reinforcements and would have then occupied a vital region within 10 kilometers of Ukraine's capital. Instead, Ukrainian resistance met the first attackers and, after the initial surprise wore off and Ukrainian mechanized reinforcements arrived, they managed to encircle the airport and eliminate at least 200 of the VDV in just a few days. Meanwhile, Ukrainian artillery cratered the runway, rendering it useless for the planned follow-on landing of the Il-76 transports. The VDV troops held on for weeks, supported by a few tanks and other vehicles that had broken through Ukrainian resistance northwest of Kyiv and had managed to link up with the Russian forces around the airfield, some of which had scattered into the nearby towns of Irpin and Bucha. However, the main column of Russian tanks and reinforcements heading south from Belarus, numbering up to 15,000 troops, never made it to the airport and were stuck in a traffic jam more than 40 kilometers long. In this ill-conceived, poorly supported and mismanaged attack, Putin wasted the best of his elite paratroops, as well as his chance for a quick, decapitating strike on the Ukrainian capital. His miscalculations of the strength and coordination of Ukrainian resistance, combined with his overconfidence about his own military's performance, were merely previews of the disasters that would unfold during the rest of his invasion of Ukraine, the Battle of the Sovietsky Donets. The first year of the invasion of Ukraine has displayed time and again the lack of military coordination on the part of the Russian forces, as well as their inability to adapt to the changing military environment during the heat of battle. Time and again, Russian forces will encounter an ambush, a minefield, or simply a well-prepared defense, and rather than regroup and try a different avenue of attack, will simply plow mindlessly ahead, regardless of the losses. One such event that perfectly encapsulates all the problems Russia is having with modern warfare is the well-documented disaster known as the Battle of the Sovietsky Donets, which occurred the 5th through the 13th of May 2022. In an effort to force a crossing of the Donetsk River in northeastern Ukraine, a Russian battalion tactical group, BTG, numbering between 1,000 and 1,500 troops, supported by tanks, armored personnel carriers, APCs, and artillery, placed a group of pontoons across the river near the small city of Sivyeski. They began to send tanks and APCs to the western side, while calling up additional vehicles on the eastern side to prepare to have them cross as well. But Ukraine had advanced warning of this attack, possibly due to satellite surveillance supplied by the US. In preparation, the Ukrainian armed forces brought up both tanks and artillery, with spotter drones overhead. When around half of the vehicles had crossed, Ukrainian artillery began pounding the two pontoon bridges already in place, isolating the forces that had already crossed. They also pounded the now massed vehicle pileup on the far side of the river, destroying a vast number of frontline combat vehicles. Rather than give up against a prepared and alert defensive formation, Russian commanders just continued to feed more forces into the cauldron. Some Russian military bloggers went beyond calling these decisions inept and suicidal and deemed them instead to be sabotage. When the surviving units finally pulled back the following week, Russia had lost over 70 tanks and other vehicles, and by some accounts more than 1,000 troops killed, wounded and missing. Retired British Major General Mick Ryan estimated that the defeat likely resulted in not just a BTG, but probably an entire brigade losing a large part of its combat power. While most Western militaries would see such a calamity as a reason to learn from such mistakes, the Russian command structure doesn't seem to know how to make adjustments. Additional major defeats where Russia seemed heedless of massive casualties occurred at regular intervals across the Ukrainian battlefield, including Kherson, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, and Volodar. Not to mention the estimated 30 to 50,000 casualties Russia may have suffered in their months-long struggle to capture the fortified region around Bakhmut. Many observers will say that the Russian-Ukrainian war might not be a fair comparison to a possible Russian-US military encounter. Isn't there some event that would provide a better metric to compare the opposing militaries? As a matter of fact, there is. The so-called Battle for the Konoko Fields, also known as the Battle of Kasham, which occurred in Syria in 2018. This was the first hot encounter between US and Russian forces since the Cold War. 
the US had stationed a handful of US Marines and Army Special Forces about five miles east of the Euphrates River, close to a vital oil drilling and pumping station in eastern Syria to help support a small group of Syrian Democratic Forces SDF fighters, also defending the site primarily against ISIS threats in the region. Russian and US forces had previously agreed that a nominal dividing line between the two forces would be the Euphrates River. They had even set up a special hotline between the two areas' command units to make sure there wouldn't be any confusion on the ground, as the Russian troops were also ostensibly opposed to ISIS at the time. At around 5 a.m. on February 7, 2018, a force of some 250 mixed Russian Wagner mercenaries and Syrian pro-government militia attempted to cross the Euphrates southwest of Kasham. US forces fired a few artillery rounds to warn them off, and they did pull back. But later in the evening around 10 p.m., the US troops were surprised to detect a column of Russian T-72 tanks and support vehicles, along with as many as 500 soldiers, heading towards their position from the east side of the Euphrates. Sporadic artillery fire and mortar fire began to hit their positions as well. The US troops followed procedure and contacted their opposite numbers using the predetermined hotline, but the Russian commanders assured them that there were no Russian troops in the area. With that reassurance, the US troops called in massive air and artillery support involving F-15E and F-22 fighter jets, B-52 bombers, AC-130 gunships, AH-64 Apache attack helicopters, MQ-9 Reaper and RQ-7B shadow drones, in addition to M777 howitzer artillery and M142 HIMARS rockets. The Russian and Syrian forces never got to within rifle range of their US targets. Four hours later, when the fighting was over, more than 100 of the attacking forces had been killed, though subestimates put that loss at closer to 330. The only casualties on the US SDF side was a single wounded SDF soldier. The lopsided nature of the encounter due to primarily the overwhelming and accurately directed air and artillery strikes supplied by the US underscored the uneven nature of the current US and Russian military forces, as well as their relative abilities to use combined arms in a coordinated fashion. The massive response was also seen as a deliberate warning to Russia not to take the US or their allies lightly. That leads us inescapably to another interesting question. Could the US on its own invade and conquer the country of Russia? Alternatively, could the US, with NATO's help, conquer Russia? Bluntly, right now there's no way the US, even with NATO's help, could physically invade and conquer Russia. Even if Russia failed to use their nukes, and you can be certain they would, there's simply no way the vast country of Russia, stretching through 11 time zones, could ever be fully occupied and pacified. Hold on though, let's break this answer down and then we can talk about some other ways the US could possibly, actually, very probably destroy Russia. It's becoming clear in the modern age that no moderately well-supplied country would be able to be occupied and defeated as long as their people maintained the will to fight. A perfect example is the relatively tiny country of Vietnam. They were one of the first countries to soundly defeat the Mongol Empire in the 13th century and resisted French occupation right up until the Japanese invaded them in 1940. After the fall of Japan in 1945, they went on the offensive to drive the French out of their country. And when they were successful and the US tried to defend the area of South Vietnam, they fought for more than a decade before driving the US out as well, despite suffering as many as a million casualties. Cambodia next thought they could occupy Vietnam's Mekong Delta. But in a mere two weeks, the Vietnamese routed the attackers and occupied the capital, Phnom Penh, which they held until 1988. China then invaded, thinking that they could impose their will on the ruling Vietnamese government. But the Vietnamese went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mighty Chinese army and after some brief but intense fighting, managed to force them to withdraw, though China considered the event merely a short, punitive expedition. Such determination to defend one's homeland would undoubtedly be faced in Russia as well, but of an order of magnitude far greater. Many segments of Russia see the current invasion of Ukraine and the implied aim of NATO to hang a strategic defeat around Putin's neck as one of an existential crisis for their country. Since Russian media is nothing more than an echo chamber for their dictator-in-chief, most commentators mirror Putin's own comments when he says that in light of such a defeat, I do not even know if such an ethnic group as the Russian people will be able to survive in the form in which it exists today. You can expect that, just as they did with their Herculean efforts to defend their country against the onslaught of Nazi Germany in World War II, Russia will fight on against any invasion, no matter the costs, the consequences, or the forces arrayed against them. They might even find a willing ally in China, 
who has been eyeing sections of Russia's Far East territories around Vladivostok that as recently as the 1850s were part of Greater China. It's entirely possible that China would be willing to help support the defense of Russia in exchange for what they currently consider historical Chinese territory. There is evidence that China has decided it's in their best interest to keep Russia as an intact nation in order to divide Western opposition. Both countries share an intense dislike of what they perceived as US hegemony throughout the world, and now that Russia has seen its oil and natural gas outlets in the West curtailed by sanctions, by necessity, they've had to turn to China and India as their two primary sources for exploiting petrochemicals. Even closer cooperation in the future is only inevitable. But wait, there's one more option. What if the US managed to topple the Russian government? This may be the trickiest of the three topics to answer. In short, yes, the US could probably topple the Putin government at any time if they wanted to. There was a recent event that showcased just how precise US strikes have become, an event that may have led Putin to decide to travel in a special armored train and to spend much of his time in isolated bunkers in Siberia, far from the active front lines. On August 2nd, 2022, the US sent a pair of specially modified Hellfire missiles to take out Ayman al-Zawahiri, one of the Al-Qaeda leaders responsible for planning various attacks on US and Western targets, including the 9-11 attacks, the bombing of the USS Cole, multiple bombings of US embassies in Africa, and others. He was tracked to a residence in Kabul, in the middle of a densely populated area. But the two drones were so precise that the US claimed Zawahiri was the only casualty of the operation. According to published reports, he was taken out while he stood on the second floor balcony of the residence with the missiles equipped with Ginsu knife-like projections. The strike was publicized in a series of press conferences, with additional US government officials warning that no matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. No doubt Putin took that threat seriously. But US military and diplomatic policy has matured since the 1950s and 60s when the CIA routinely toppled governments, many of them democratically elected, in countries like Iran, South Vietnam, Chile, Guatemala, the Congo, and others. Nowadays, the US prefers to let its military-industrial complex do the talking, such as when they toppled Saddam's regime in Iraq. In retrospect, despite the overwhelming military victory the US achieved, the end result was ultimately seen by many as seriously flawed as the US had no plan to replace the removed Iraqi government with any kind of stable and reliable replacement. And that may be the one main reason why the US doesn't want to topple the Putin dictatorship. There are fears that whoever might replace him could be far worse. The one element of his arsenal that Putin has dared not yet use is his nuclear arsenal. He probably knows that as long as he doesn't employ nukes, then the West will worry he's the only thing holding back a massive nuclear war. He's betting that the US and the West will worry that whoever comes next might not hold back. And so, we've come full circle. It's clear that the one ace in the hole that Russia still holds onto is its nuclear deterrent. Putin dare not use them, for fear that doing so will unleash a horrific response from the West. But Putin has to threaten to use them in fear that their possible use is the only thing keeping NATO from sending actual troops to drive the Russian invaders out of Ukraine. And the West dare not take Putin out directly, for fear that his replacement might be willing to use nukes in an act of suicidal revenge. And so, the world balances on a precarious knife's edge, closer to a nuclear holocaust than we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis of the early 1960s. It would be best if all sides could take one giant step back from the precipice, but Putin seems incapable of backing down, and the brave Ukrainians are determined to take their country back, as well they should. The most likely outcome is that some oligarch will find a willing accomplice in Putin's cook staff, and the Russian president will succumb to a bout of severe intestinal distress following which, some level-headed replacement will endeavor to repair the massive damage Putin's done both to Ukraine and to his own country. At least, that's what many sane people hope. Don't forget, before he was the leader of the Wagner Group, the oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin had a very special nickname, Putin's Chef. But what do you think? Could the US military conquer Russia all on its own? How would they do it? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.